Please welcome back Chuck Klosterman. So thanks for picking that. Oh, well, my pleasure. Thanks for showing it. Um, I, maybe you could uh, start by telling us how you discovered this film. It's not a film that shows very much. It doesn't circulate very widely, and it's actually pretty obscure. Yeah, well, it's difficult to find. We were talking about this before we came out. Like, it doesn't stream anywhere. The disc is pretty difficult. I mean, you can f buy it used. I think that it must have been the Akron Public Library. I think is where I, when I lived in Akron, Ohio, I feel like I went through a phase where I watched a lot of movies like this, and their library was very good. It was curated by a guy who really knew what he was doing, and they had a lot of VHSs. I think that must have been where I saw it. Um, I usually have a pretty good memory for like where I was actually physically sitting and the conditions of it, but I, I don't so much with this. I just remember specific scenes from it. The beginning, particularly, the thing with the cross, of course, you know. So it's been some years since you've yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, well, but I would say, I don't know if 20, but close, yeah. So how, would, how, do you say, how would you say it holds up? I mean, it's a film that, as you were alluding to in your introduction, obviously plays very differently today Yeah. from you know when it was released in 1967, but also even 20 years ago. I wouldn't imagine it had different sort of... I mean, I think that when anything, when a film is this kind of straightforwardly allegorical or whatever, when there's uh, lines in the movie that are supposed to have you know double meanings and are supposed to be reflective, is whenever time moves forward, those things end up you know becoming, um, they seem like the center of the film in the way that I don't recall them being the first time I saw it. Right. Uh, the manager in the movie, the, yeah, that's a, that character seems like a bigger deal to me now than it would have mm -hmm. been then. So um, maybe we could just talk a little bit more about picking this film and mm -hmm. how it relates to the book. Uh, well, you know, my book basically is um, an attempt to visualize how people in 100 or 300 or 1,000 years will look back at this specific period of time. Um, in the same way that when we think about history, the criteria we use for kind of measuring what's meaningful or what's important is different than the criteria we use in day-to-day -day life. And of course, that's going to happen to our period as well. People who have not yet been born in some distant future are going to sort of almost construct the, the meaning of the history that we're experiencing. Um, so now, how does that translate to picking a movie? <laughs> well, not that great. I guess my, the, the one idea was like, well, it could be Planet of the Apes. I guess that's an example where like people were wrong, um, but uh, you and I were just kind of emailing back and forth, and, and I like the idea of this film being set, you know, in a a shorter uh, future. But of course, that future is now our past, and that was kind of what I thought the way it fit in with this book. The idea of that we're they're thinking that when the, when this film came out, they were thinking, well, this is the direction culture is going. Um, maybe it's, this isn't exactly what's going to happen, but the, the sort of the trajectory of, of public interest and, and sort of the uh, political ideology of the country or whatever is moving toward this. And now we're, of course, looking back at the 70s in a very different way. So it's like this is like set in a 70s that never happened to anyone. It was an imagined future and then like an incorrect past. Was there one particular thing that triggered this idea for the book for you? It's a pretty, it's you know, it's a pretty abstract thing to write a book about. It is, I guess. I think it was like, um, you know, it's like these things always happen, kind of gradually and then suddenly. So in a way, I guess maybe I've always been the kind of person who thought this way, even before I could ever put it in any language. Like I feel like even when I was nine years old, I was like, I just feel like there's the way what. The perception of this reality is wrong somehow. Like there's just something that seems as though we're almost trying to explain something that's unexplainable. And then over the last five or six years, I think the other, some of the other books I had written before this and also working as the ethicist at the Times for three years uh, maybe moved me in this direction. Then there was this kind of a specific weekend or a Thursday night or something where I was watching the Fox reboot of the series Cosmos. Fox redid the Carl Sagan uh, kind of, uh, you know, an updated version of Cosmos. And, and it was actually pretty good. And um, the parts that I found most interesting would be these periods where they would sort of animate, say, some kind of 
generally forgotten scientists from the 1500s or the 1600s and they would basically express the idea that everyone in the world kind of unilaterally thought one thing and then this one person introduces an, I an idea, a new idea or in kind of a new understanding and within one generation it was almost as if we had always thought this. The whole period prior to this person's existence where we thought something differently about a real central idea was just gone and I thought well that must be happening now. Like we can't see it because we're inside the system, but there must be things that are happening now that we just sort of accept that in a period after we are dead, it's just gonna be just totally wiped away or remembered as a, a real absurd thing, like a kind of a comical reflection on this time. And then while I was watching this, I had my laptop and I was reading about Moby Dick. I always say, like, I wasn't reading Moby Dick. I was just reading about it on the internet, looking at Wikipedia. I probably had started looking at, probably had something to do with Led Zeppelin, probably. And I just kept reading until I got to sort of the life of Herman Melville. And, and this is not some obscure thing, but like Herman Melville wrote Moby Dick. He thought it would be his masterpiece, like his defining thing. And then it came out and it got mixed reviews, didn't sell very well, kind of ruined his life. He ended up working in, like, became a poet and an alcoholic, and he worked in the customs department, and he died. Um, and then many years after his death, after World War I, there was this rediscovery of the book, not just as a good book, but as the book. Like, this is what an American novel is supposed to be or whatever. So that's a subjective thing, right? That's the relationship we have with art and how that changes. And the science thing, that's an objective thing, that these are facts and the facts change. But they somehow seem connected to me, that, that there are a lot of things like this, that, that we just sort of operate from the position that our understanding of what the world is like and what reality is like is just how it's going to be in perpetuity. And of course it won't. Of course it will, people will look back and think that it was crazy that we thought these things, or they'll reimagine what we thought. Mm -hmm. um, and while everyone kind of accepts that, like everyone kind of assumes that ideas are going to change, when you give specific examples, People get very uncomfortable with that. Uh, the example I use always is like if we went out on the street and we just stopped a guy and said, hey, do you think it's possible that in 100 years uh, we're going to perceive great presidents differently and that maybe somebody we think is a great president now will not be viewed as being important or significant later? Uh, the person would go like, well, sure, that happens with presidents all the time. We're always reshuffling. You know, but then you go, okay, it's going to be Lincoln then they immediately think you're insane. Like in the abstract, everyone understands that these ideas that we have are not stable, but when you start talking about specific things, it gets real strange. And that's what the book kind of is, is trying to look at specific things like literature, rock music, television, football, politics, and try to think of, well, if, if the history of ideas is kind of the history of being wrong, what are the things right now that we don't even question? We don't even view them as questions. They're just sort of the way we live. If those things are incorrect, why will they be incorrect? Or why will our perception change? I think one really effective thing about the book, because it ranges so widely in all these f fields, as you mentioned, is how you also bring in a lot of different voices, mm. um, sort of, you know, I guess, experts in the field, you would say, and, and really engage with them on, on, on these questions. Um, I'm just curious, if, you know, how you, how you pick some of these um, you know, musicians or writers or filmmakers and uh, you, you do get into it in the book of course but um, it's it's a uh, it's a, it's an interesting list of people it, it is I, I mean the, the, the I, uh, unlike some of my other books that were more essay collections where I would just be kind of like I have the idea I'm doing it there's no one else involved I was like if I'm gonna talk about sort of what we might be wrong about I first need to establish the baseline of what we think so I need, like I actually need to talk to experts kind of just to get the conventional wisdom to go to somebody and say like hey you know, I'm not disagreeing with how you perceive the world. I probably perceive it the same way, but I'm just curious, do you think there's any possibility that these things that we are, that are kind of the building blocks of how we understand the world, that those things are wrong? Um, so then how do you do that? Well, in a, in a way, like when it was, when it, for, in the science section, I kind of went after the biggest scientists I could think of, like Neil deGrasse Tyson and Brian Greene. I mean, I really just went to like, who are people who are already in a position where they sort of have become the face of this already? Um, in terms of musicians and rock critics and stuff, I just kind of used my own personal experience. I happened to have had a kind of a weird interaction relationship with David Byrne 
15 years ago, 16 years ago. So I contact him and I was like, do you remember me? Kind of, you know, and he did. And we talked about it. I had done, I had done something with the musician Ryan Adams once, like kind of some kind of event. And we had a good talk afterwards. So he kept me in his phone and I was able to contact him. Um, I interviewed Richard Linklater um, just because I, I think that he deals with the idea of time and the sort of and dreaming, which is a section of the book, better than anyone else. I think that's what his real strength is as a, as a director. And I just tried to find him, and, and I found him. You know, uh, so what what I'd really do is I would just kind of think of topics and be like, well, who'd be an interesting person? And then can I find that person? And you know, if it had been my first book, I think it'd have been really impossible. But because I've written a few books, it seemed like I could usually get to these people. And I gotta say, if you say to somebody, I wanna talk to you about something that won't be proven wrong or right for 500 years, for the most part, they're like, sure. <laughs> like this, you know, it's like, like, I'll speculate on how people who aren't even born yet might remember this time. Like, they kind of were into the hypothetical. So it wasn't that hard. John Franzen said no, Jennifer Egan said no. Um, I'm trying to think of a few other people. I only, it was like three people I asked who, did, who said no. Everybody else said yes. So let's just come back to privilege um, uh, briefly. You, in the little um, blurb that you wrote, um, you, 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 you said that the film is both sort of dated and also prescient or yeah. sort of like, for, you know, can you elaborate on, on that a little bit? Well, you know, I think the dated parts are pretty straightforward when you watch it. I mean, like it's, it's someone doing kind of a faux documentary, and that often does not, it doesn't date real well. I mean, uh, you know, I think that that you know the, the fashion of Britain at that time really puts it in a specific thing. But just also the idea, its idea of rock music, I think probably is the most dated thing. Like I had said in the introduction, like you know, this is the year that Sgt. Pepper had come out, and that was the first time that a rock record had been sort of taken seriously by lots of people, even people who weren't fans of it, you know. I don't know what Watkins' view of rock really was at the time, but the potentiality of music was much different then. I think that there was sort of a, uh, like a, a real lack of clarity over how meaningful this thing would be, would it always be something that was like isolated to youths of the 50s and 60s or whatever. Um, but then the ideas that are real forward thinking are sort of its sort of larger ideas I think about celebrity. Now granted, as I said before, I think the mechanism of how that happened uh, ended up being completely reversed. Like it, it isn't the idea, the way that we view pop celebrity now is not something that is really inflicted upon us by any sort of government. It's almost as though they have no relationship, but the f audience for, for popular culture has sort of decided that there's a relationship they want to have uh, with the kind of apex of fame. That, you know, I mean, the, the people in this day and age would be people like Beyonce and Taylor Swift and stuff, that, that, that they want to sort of have them represent with almost any small action they do, kind of it having, having a sweeping uh, sort of impact on how you could feasibly view your own life or your own experience. And I think that, that, there, that the way that he is sort of portrayed in this film uh, seems pretty modern to me. All right, we'll open it up to uh, audience for questions. You can ask questions about Chuck's work or about the film or comments. Yes. You know, I thought it was very good, and I did not think that there would be another Radiohead record that I liked as much as this new one. I sort of thought that the last one that I would think was really good would be In Rainbows. And then they would, Tom York would make solo records, and they would kind of almost enter this new sort of period in their career where the idea of having a, a, sort of a large acceptance for their music would be done, but I thought this record was very, very good. I think in general, this has been a strangely good year for music. I think that the Car Seat Headrest record is very good. I thought that Monkey's covered album was very good. I just, uh, so I liked it, I guess, yeah. That's not that random. Yeah, you, got, you inspired me to listen to Radiohead, and I'm obsessed now. Like, oh, wow, well, I did something for someone then, so, okay. <laughs> 
books are awesome. Oh, thanks. So Thank Uh, well, you know, if you if you go on YouTube and watch the trailer for this, because I was thinking maybe the whole movie might be on YouTube, but it doesn't appear to be what the trailer is. And it was really promoted, as it turns out, as like, this is the revolutionary controversial idea. I think the last line in the trailer is like, like Peter Watkins dares to do what no one else dares to think. Which kind of seems like an overstatement. It doesn't seem like an impossible thing to think. I mean, how it's kind of grouped in. I mean, his previous movie what, to this was uh, like The War Game. And that was like a, f like a short documentary, but I believe it won a whole bunch of awards. Yeah, I mean, it's like kind of a pseudo documentary. Yeah. It did win the Academy Award yeah. for Best Documentary. I, I, I mean, where would this, I mean, you would know more than I, where well, this would be classified sort of in a, yeah. I don't know how it would be classified. Um... Is that an answer? Are you uh, trying to going to answer that question, or is that a new? Yes. Uh, be no. <laughs> there are, first of all, there are reviews available. You can find Roger Ebert's review, which in his take was basically like, this is an important movie, maybe not a great movie, uh, he talks about Jean Shrimpton. I remember he says like she's a little bit like Julie Christie, but just a little bit. It was better. Um, it was better received in the U.S. than in the U.K. Was yeah. Um, in terms of like all the you know the, but w what I was sort of saying the, of the corporate stuff. I mean that's a good point. That's an interesting point. I'm glad you like this movie. Um, I I think though the the underpinnings of it are so different now that it does. I mean if we talk about the idea of sort of 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 corporate forces sort of using the popular culture to manipulate or, or or to pacify the public it's almost more of like a capitalist concern like it's not so much of a of a government like i don't know if uh i i mean this is it seems like a like a pretty obvious thing to say but like it definitely seems say like coca-cola is more interested in youth culture than the political system in the united states for example like they 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 have more to gain. Coca Cola has more to gain from sort of understanding or shaping. I'm not taking Coke in specific. I'm just saying a corporation like that. Um, I think in a film like this, uh, you know, it's it has a lot of sort of like kind of like Orwellian aspects. That's like the government wants us to conform because like you know in every movie when it's a dystopic future. Everyone is being forced to conform. It doesn't matter if it's Gattaca, anything. That's always what it is. Like, no, no one's ever made a dystopic movie about, like, people are going to be too free in the future. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to have some rippling effect. I mean, that never happens, right? Um, so I just, I don't know. I mean, also, you know, I've been raised in the United States I would, I, my whole life. I, I've, you know, I've lived outside of the United States four months in my life, so I don't really have an understanding of how someone from England views sort of the nature of England outside of sort of what I've heard people say, and who knows how true that really is. <coughs> The best candidate, or who could actually be one? <laughs> um, um, well, for fascist underpinnings specifically, like if okay, let's say so, like, like okay, this is an interesting question. So like, let's say like Trump became president, and he decided that he wanted to use popular culture to shape the. Way. I suppose the like okay Beyonce and Taylor Swift are the best candidates I guess it depends on what kind of person you're going after in a way like who you want to pacify or control more um I have a hard time imagining who could organically become that person because the thing is as really like in the like anyway we're, I guess we're talking mostly about music we don't wouldn't necessarily have to be but I mean like Culture is different now, right? Everyone accepts this. That it's, 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 there's less of a monoculture. The monoculture is sort of kind of created by social media, but that's an impossible thing to harness. Um, I suppose in many ways, in a general sense, it just makes the idea of this less pl plausible. 
I mean, for something to work in this way, the monoculture is central to this, that everyone is sort of experiencing things together at the same time. You know, um, So it would have to be, I guess, just going on this conversational path that I'm making up as I'm going along, it would have to be something that's involved with the monoculture, and that's the only thing that's really left for that is sports. So I guess it would almost have to be some kind of like Michael Jordan, Steph Curry figure who is sort of in doing something in a live venue so that people have to watch it at the same time and share this experience. It would almost have to be that, I think. Because it would, Brady. it's, what? Tom Brady. <laughs> Tom Brady, well, that's, you know, that's another, that's possible as well. During the Bush administration, Patriots Bush. Well, okay, well, you know, it's because, you know, because Tom Brady obviously is friends with Trump, okay, he's kind of, is in a way endorsing Trump. And a friend of mine was just texting me with this the other day. He was like, he really bothers him that Brady is endorsing, you know, seems to support Trump. But I did add, you know, it does raise an interesting question unrelated to this movie. But let's say you knew someone who you were casual friends with, but you've been friends with many years. And they were in a position to become president. And you disagreed with most of their platform. In fact, some of it you vehemently disagreed with. Would your personal relationship make you support them? I mean, I, I, I ran through like a whole list of friends that I wouldn't say are close friends, but people who that I've been friends with for more than 10 years. And I thought, well, if this guy ran for president or if this woman ran for president and was in a position to win and I disagreed with them, would my personal relationship sort of, you know, and I, so that's what I was thinking about Tom Brady. I mean, like, in a way, it seems odd that Tom Brady would support Trump. But in another way, if he's played golf with him 25 times, I mean, how often? I, I don't know. It's a strange question. Well, see, this is actually a key problem and one of the things in the book I write about, but I can't really answer. Okay, what you're really sort of talking about when you're saying the dissemination of information, you're really talking about the internet, essentially, right? That's what we're really talking. Mean, television is part of this, but it's like that's the main thing. Okay. Well, there's two ways to think of it, and both seem completely reasonable. One is that when people look back on this period of time particularly because of social media, they will have many, many more voices sort of to sample. Whereas if we go back to say, you know, 1939, we have to dig to find people who were like, you know, like uh, people who, who had uh, sort of uh, unusual ideas about entering the war or whatever, or even going back further, it's like uh, in the 1700s, if you're trying, trying to deal with a novelist from the 1870s to find a lot of ideas about that person's work outside of a few reviews in the work itself, it's kind of difficult. So those things are almost like kind of blank slates. Well, that won't be the case now. Okay, like when somebody looks back on someone like Jonathan Franzen or Jennifer Egan or whatever, there's going to be just this multitude of people who have sort of expressed in many ways the same idea about them. So the question becomes is, does this sort of plur pre like, like uh, you know, splintering of ideas and democratizing communication, does that, will that give us a more accurate view of this period because they'll have more things to sample, the person in the future? Or will we sort of form a monoculture through that? And because there's so many voices, will ideas be difficult to overturn? Because certainly now, like we go back, this movie's not even that old, 67. It's enough time has passed, though, where if we kept talking about this movie, we could come up with a completely different interpretation of what it meant. Okay, outside of its plot, we could just totally, we could almost invent what this movie means. Because, like, you know, it's hard to find the reviews even of it. Like, I only saw a couple. You know? um, any movie that comes out now, that's not going to be the case. Will it be more difficult to overturn the sort of the present tense idea? So this is like one of the things I'm kind of, I just, I think is real fascinating. It's like, because we've democratized communication, is it going to be harder or easier to overturn pre-existing ideas? Okay, well his question is basically, is there any, he's like, uh, some political idea that we sort of all accept now that will be seen as absurd in a future, okay? And, in the, and, now, and this is always a weird thing because what I'm going to say is something I've thought about, I don't really feel, okay, but I've thought about this, okay? So 
right now when people talk about sort of American as America as a society, as a superpower, our success as a nation over the last 200 and whatever years, okay, very often it comes back to the idea of the Constitution and democracy, right? That these are, the, you know, and like the founding fathers were brilliant and they came up with this great idea and, and that they were smarter than other people who had started countries in the past and because America's a little younger, that the success of America is sort of based on this, you know, the, this document, this brilliant document. In fact, if I was running for office and I was like, I'm against the Constitution, I probably could not become city alderman, you know. But I was like thinking to myself, what if we're looking back at America after it has fallen in the same way we look like back at Spain after the Spanish Armada and stuff like that. So it's in a way distant future. We're looking back at America as like a previous superpower and it's a chapter in a book. And it says there was this country and they had this document and this document was everything. And they made the document so hard to change that after 10 initial changes, they could barely change it at all. And in fact, at one point, they wanted to add an amendment called the Equal Rights Amendment. People were like, no way too dangerous, okay? They made the, the document very inflexible, and yet it was supposed to sort of basically hold the country together even after it went from 13 colonies to this huge expanse of land. The population went totally exponentially up. Uh, you know, at this point, people living here, how much relationship do you really have with people living in rural Alabama or in Wyoming or whatever? Not much, but this document's supposed to tie us all together. If America were to eventually hemorrhage and fail, it might look like, boy, they sure put too much reliance on this singular document. So this thing that we perceive as our greatest strength could over time become a weakness. This is the kind of things that I kind of work through in this book. Now, like I say, I don't even know if I feel that, but I, I think it like I, like there's a conscious part of me that says that seems like the way someone in the future would look back on something that we were very confident about. Yep. When I was watching it again now, um, in my mind, I sort of had remembered this whole movie being the whole thing was that he was this construct from the beginning. And the movie does say that, I guess, explicitly, but it doesn't seem that way. Early on, it almost seems like they're just like, this is a great idea for an entertainer, almost. Like, it looks a little bit like the early Alice Cooper stuff, in a way. You know, like, it doesn't seem that, uh, you know, that was something I thought when I was watching this. Um, it is. I mean, I think that that as a real, like, I wouldn't say this movie isn't like cogent, but it's like it's there's flaw. Like that's it, that's a confusing thing. I, it does it does. I, it, it would be hard to deduce what the political meaning of that is from the perspective of the state. Why would they want that outside of the idea that by sort of sort of hitting this guy with violence on stage? It sort of allows people to have like this sort of false sense of because the cops are part of the act too, so it's sort of like you know the idea of a, like a, a like a fabricated sense of violence that would then take away people's desire for real violence. Although that doesn't really seem to be the way people generally think about culture. I mean, like certainly in the '90s, the fear was always like if there's a violent movie, we have to show it on a Wednesday night. We can't let it open on Friday because it'll cause a riot or whatever. Like the idea was that if they see violent things, they'll act violently it would be pretty forward thinking of a government to be like we need to give people violent things so they'll be comfortable with it or you know yeah i mean my if, like his podcast is called revisionist history i guess my thing would be like revisionist now yeah <laughs> um, like I'm revising things here in history yet. Um, no, I listened to Gladwell's the, the, the of the three that he did. The first one was about um, the painter. That was pretty good. The one about Vietnam I didn't like as much, uh, and then the the basketball one I thought was very good. Um, uh, you know, that's just sort of like that's that's what he's great at. I mean, he's like he's a real a real has a real talent for just sort of sort of speculating and then very persuasively arguing that the conventional wisdom is wrong. Yeah. We'll leave time for a signing, so we'll just take one more question, if there is one. No final yep. question? Yep.
Okay, it's uh, okay. Well, because I have I I was if you don't I, I was I worked at Spin for a bunch of years and then I worked at GQ, so I've done a lot of celebrity profiling on this. Yeah. Um, well, in terms of the person having an experience where they seem to have no agency on what was happening within the world of their hyper fame, the only one I would say was close was Britney Spears. I mean, she definitely seemed to have. For, for that level of fame, the least amount of sort of, of uh, control over how her, could, her career went because she'd been famous at such a young age that what, what really happened with her, I mean, it's really kind of a sad thing. It's like the people around her saw different ways for her to be successful, so she lost track of what was her life and what was marketing. Like she would walked out of a Kentucky Fried Chicken once barefoot, okay, and then she got photographed. And I think she was initially embarrassed by it, but all the people around her were like, "That's great. That makes you look real, real," you know. And then she was like, "Oh, so this thing that I didn't want to have happened worked out. I guess the things that I just do are part of my character or whatever." That and she was younger too, um, but like I mean, like Taylor Swift is not like that. Taylor Swift had a ton of control. Obviously, someone like Bono uh, has a huge amount of not just control over himself, but over other people. Um, the guys in Radiohead, I think, felt like they were kind of like Tom York. I think felt maybe he was a little bit being forced into something he wasn't totally comfortable with, but he could have stopped it. He didn't, you know. Um, Somebody like Eddie Van Halen didn't seem to think about stuff like this. He was like, it's just, it, it, like, it never, the idea of how much control I have in my life is not, I, I, I'm, I'm interested in my guitar. Like, that's what I'm interested in. Um, so I would say of those people, I guess Britney Spears is the only one that I immediately think of where I did feel a degree of sympathy for her awesome life. Because her awesome life did not seem that awesome if you're her. But, yeah. Well, hey, um, thank you very much for coming out and listening to this tonight. Like, I, I guess I'm going to sign up there. Um, uh, it was just, it was very cool, and I hope you liked the movie. So thanks. Thanks a lot, Chuck. Thank you.